Okay, so um, so shifting now. So the reason, the main reason I wanted to talk is that you know I generally describe myself as a proponent of free markets. I believe that capitalist culture and institutions um, are responsible for the incredible advancements and quality of life over the last one to 200 years. So that is my view. I consider myself a proponent of limited government, but when people ask me, uh, you know, do I think that the state should play a role in the economy under certain circumstances, I do tend to make the following argument. And I'm pretty sure you disagree with it. And I'm open-minded on this subject. I'm certainly not doctrinaire about it. Um, but you know, my current view I think is different from yours. And I wanna understand what you would say in response to this point of view. So let me just lay it out in like three to four minutes and then you can respond. So, um, for the last few years, I've been saying to people in conversations about this that even though states rarely succeed in fostering innovation and in turbocharging complex industrialization, states can be extremely useful and may even be critical for achieving these objectives, particularly if the goal is to achieve them quickly. Um, and the basic argument here is that private firms have fewer resources than states and they have to be profitable, unlike states. Having fewer resources than states and needing to be profitable, unlike states, means that private firms are less likely to have enough resources or enough appetite for risk to make the investments necessary to develop highly expensive technologies that may take decades to become marketable, like aircraft, rockets, the internet. Mm -hmm. um, States also don't have enough resources to make the initial investments necessary to get really complex industries going, steel, cars, ships, electronics, computers, and to protect them and nurture them in their, infant, in their infancy. Um, so for these reasons, I've heard it said that the state is necessary for the development of technologies, but that the, uh, or let me say that again. I've heard it said that the state is, uh, necessary for developing technologies and that the private sector is really good at commercializing them. Uh, one other point that I'll make uh, in this regard is that states also at times have really powerful incentives to develop technologies and industries unlike any, in unlike any incentives that companies might have. And I'm talking about total war. I'm talking about existential conflict. Total wars provide states with an unparalleled incent incentive, an existential incentive to develop and improve technologies because if they don't, they're gonna get destroyed. And it's remarkable in this connection to think about how many major technologies in the 20th century in the United States originated or rapidly advanced during World War II, whether it's aircrafts or semiconductors. Now, I want to immediately qualify this by saying, admittedly, in many countries, it might be impossible for the state to drive innovation or to nurture successful industries of the future. The state might be too corrupt. The society may not have sufficient human capital so that state investment is relevant. Sure. But if the state is not too corrupt, and if there is sufficient human capital, state action may be the only way to innovate and to become competitive in complex sectors, or at least to do so relatively quickly. And the two main examples that I have in mind when I think about these arguments are the US in the 20th century. I think that's a good example of state investments, particularly Pentagon funding being necessary for hugely important innovations in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and then the East Asian tigers, South Korea and Taiwan, and to some extent China, uh, are good examples, I think, of state investments being necessary for the creation of really successful competitive companies in complex sectors of the economy, like steel, shipbuilding, cars, electronics, right. computers, where these countries, if they had just done what they had comparative advantage in, they may never have uh, developed these sectors, and they certainly wouldn't have done so as quickly as they did. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there, but so, so, so again, um, I'm generally a proponent of free markets, but it does seem to me that the state has played a really important role in developing innovative technologies, particularly, for example, in the United States in the 20th century, and in turbocharging a complex industrialization process, as has been seen in the case of the East Asian tigers in the last 50 to 75 years. So what do you say to that? Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a pretty common argument among economists and, um, and among um, proponents of, of 
you know, the, the I'd say the better proponents of a limited government who think government should intervene in basic science and certain uh, issues around technology. I, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's wrong. I, I think it's, again, I, I'll start with the moral point, with the philosophical point. Mm-hmm. And that is, even if everything you said was true, which I don't think it is, but, uh, and we'll get to that, but even if that were true, then I'd still be against it because, so progress will be slower. So technology will take longer. Um, I don't, I certainly don't think you use the word necessary a number of times. I don't think any of that is necessary, right? Mm-hmm. I, there's no proof of that. And I'll give some counter examples. Um, but the much more fundamental point is, uh, the state has to, uh, take money from some people to give to others that I think is morally offensive and morally wrong. It then allocates it based on priorities that have nothing to do long-term, I think, with human well-being, even in the best run states. Uh, we can focus on the, I don't know the exact percentage, and nobody's done the research that I know of, of the exact percentage, on the success stories. And we ignore the failures, uh, probably 90% of the investments. All the research grants that went to nothing, because, and we don't know because <laughs> we don't know them, right? Um, some you can see the white elephant petrochemical and drug industry investment the Japanese government tried to steer the economy towards, and you can travel through Japan and see the massive plants that sit empty today uh, because because what we know is the industries were successful. We, we forget about the stuff that wasn't, and we don't have a counterfactual, right? We don't have the alternative. Um, so, so, you know, we now have philosopher kings deciding what technology is going to be good and what isn't, who among scientists should be invested in and who shouldn't. I think that while, again, we see the successes, what we don't see are the things that might have gotten funded under a different system that didn't for political reasons. Uh, what about all the stem cell stuff that could have happened if not for Republicans uh, under Bush and others uh, are stopping it? What about all the nuclear technology that would have evolved if not for the state stopping it? You know, um, if the state is going to fund science, the state's going to regulate science. Um, what about the fact that it's probably likely that if I do a, if I get a government grant and my results of my study are, you know what? The world is doing great. Things are fantastic. Don't do anything. I probably will never get another grant, but if the results of my study are, the world's gonna end in 20 years unless we do X, Y, Z, I need another grant to study how to do X, Y, Z effectively. I'm, I probably guaranteed myself a lifetime of funding, right? And, and I take, I take um, uh, climate change as an example, and maybe COVID, you know, maybe you could argue some of the stuff in COVID is related to government funding of science and, and the incentive that is associated with that. So I am very skeptical about government funded science. Uh, it's true that if you give hundreds of scientists money, thousands of scientists money, which is what the government does, grants to thousands of scientists, a few of them will do major things that will have import and we will all identify, yes, you know, the woman who single-handedly basically drove mRNA technology, right? Just, she was a bulldog. She's a, she's a Romanian immigrant to the United States that worked at the University of Pennsylvania for a while. And she just wrote grant application after grant. Most of them were turned down, but she was just a bulldog. She just stuck with it and she got it. We got a vaccine. Now you could say the government did it because they funded her. Yeah, but what about all the grants she didn't get? Maybe we could have you know, save 20 years on this. I mean, who knows? Hmm. But the point is, yes, if you, if you diversify enough, which is what government does, uh, some of it will succeed. The mRNA technology will succeed. What about the, the, the thousands of scientific grants that were given to people who found no results? Or here's one other, one other example just came to me. What about all the research into um, that the government funded, government promoted, and then the government supported into, for example, uh, health. So for example, what we should eat, you know, the government food pyramid, mm-hmm. well, there's major, major evidence it's wrong, right? 
it's it's just wrong. It's not good for you. And it maybe it's it's the cause of the obesity crisis, right? Because it emphasizes simple carbs and sugar and things like that. And fat, you know, for a variety of reasons, fat might not be that bad for you, particularly in comparison to things like sugar. Um, all government sci government driven science, all a disaster. Maybe have caused massive obesity in this country, uh, uh, and uh, uh, massive amounts of, of uh, diabetes and heart disease and so on. Do we weigh the costs of that versus the benefit that we attribute to all the other stuff? I'm not, I'm not convinced that if you weighed that properly, you would get a positive outcome. Okay, now to some of the specifics. Um, so with regard to government development of technology and its role in developed technology, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a, a website that I think, you know, it's just, it's just a, an amazing resource and uh, uh, provide a lot of, and it's not necessarily disagreeing with you, but it, it, uh, for, for those arguing for the extreme, just all government driven and everything, this guy really presents some great arguments and he goes through the books and he, so this is called, his name is, he, he, it's Nintil, N-I-N-T-I-L.com, N I N. TAL.com. He's Spanish, so you have to uh, you have to put on translate, but the translations are really good um, for his, art, his articles. But um, this guy is just brilliant in my view. I mean, he went through the entrepreneurial state, that that book by I forget her name, and he goes section, he goes pretty much paragraph by paragraph and and questions. And he goes to the original research. So he goes to sources, right? So she'll cite something, he'll go to the citation and show what's really going on. Anyway, um, this is the conclusion he came to about war because he has a whole thing about the Air Force, about, uh, about the idea of, of uh, he had two things that he cites. Uh, first, he says, most economic historians, including, for example, uh, an economist by the name of Joel McCoy, M-O-K-Y-R, assess the effects of war on technological innovation as largely negative with a few exceptions, right? Oh, with a few exceptions of economists, but most economists, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the reason of the above is that war encourages a conservative approach to technology, inducing demand for existing technology. Thus, most war technology was developed prior to the war. Uh, third point, the more developed a technology is, the harder for spin-offs spin -offs of military technology to be successful. Uh, four, more research is required, uh, understanding the effects of military R&D, uh, but, but, but that whole research is plagued with difficulties. There's, there's real difficulties in assessing that. So it seems like most economic historians, and I haven't studied the literature thoroughly, mm -hmm. actually think technology innovation. And for example, World War II. Uh, one of the things that World War II did very well is leverage Bell, Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. And what it what it went to Bell and, and it leveraged some British uh, some British scientists, but what they did is they basically went to Bell Labs and, and basically accelerated the development of existing technologies or technologies that were being speculated on, and now there was funding to go full throttle. And, and there's no question that happened and that accelerated it. Uh, I don't think that's true of the uh, of of uh, of ultimately the semiconductor, but certainly some of the other technologies. The semiconductor really did come out of Bell Labs. Um, and you could argue about Bell Labs, is it a pure, is it a lab that was really private because it was protected in a sense by AT&T's monopoly power that was granted by government. So a real monopoly in the sense that government granted it. Uh, but, but there were other, other uh, 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 corporate labs and other uh, private research labs. Um, he also makes the point about aircraft because there's a lot, there's a book about, right? And he, he reviews the book that says aircraft development couldn't have happened if not for. Uh, so this is what he writes about this, which I, th I thought, what would a counterfactual look like, he says to the whole uh, question. Imagine no world wars, no air mail subsidies, no NACA, which I guess was, a, was, a, was an entity that, that the government ran. Um, scientists working for NACA would be elsewhere. Without military pressure for NACA, Galset, and other Guggenheim-funded uh, uh, or other Guggenheim-funded colleges, would have taken the throne, so other Guggenheim funded colleges would have taken the throne of top aircraft research centers. Aircraft manufacturing would have remained low as research advanced, eventually advances in this technology, perhaps even funded by manufacturers, 
would have enabled the construction of profitable aircraft. Following the same route, jet engines would have been integrated at some point. So I'm willing to grant that the government's support was very important and that it could have accelerated the pace of development. But the mass manufacturing of aircraft for the war did not. I thus conclude here that war was not necessary for the appearance and growth of an aircraft industry, but that it could have accelerated it, could have accelerated uh, government isn't an ex uh, NACA, which is the one entity he cites here, isn't an example of state entrepreneurship, as apparently the ones pushing for the case for NACA forward were the Aeronautical Society, who just wanted to see more progress in things they liked. And the initial reaction of government officials wasn't very appreciative. That is, there was a lot of resistance uh, from government, as you'd expect. Um, so on every one of these technologies, what is the counterfactual? So, and, and here, I think he undermines the, I mean, the kind of fact is much larger, right? What happens if we're not taxing people at 50% of their income? What happens if we're not taking, uh, you know, 20 something percent of corporate profits? What happens if private, if government is not crowding out? And we know the crowding out effect, well documented in economics. What happens if government is not crowding out private entrepreneurs, private businesses, private philanthropists from investing in science and technology. Um, I, I can guess, I don't have the parallel universe in which it's happening, but we know that private, that private entrepreneurs are interested in science, for example. We know that billionaires, imagine if a billion, if there are more billionaires, because under capitalism, I believe there'll be many more billionaires, right? Standard of living would be much higher, partially because I think they would be funding science and they would be funding more science more effectively. The grant system, science grant system in the United States is broken. It is ineffectual. Even people in the, the, that are associated with the state funding of, know this. Uh, for example, one just little observation. It used to be that young scientists got the majority of the grants. Today, it's old scientists get the majority of the grants. Yet innovation is almost not exclusively, but almost exclusively a young person's game. Think of the big breakthroughs of Einstein. Almost all of them came when he was very young. It's, you know, it just is. It's, it's, true, in, uh, it's true in almost every field that, that uh, particularly thinking outside of the box and thinking new and breaking out of the box is, is, is something, a phenomena of, of younger people. Um, so, you know, just fixing that would probably change the pace of innovation. And yet one could imagine the private entrepreneurs, private businesses would, would be much more oriented towards success, much more oriented towards result orientation, much more, just like I think charity would be much more effective at helping the poor than welfare. Because I think people who gave to charity would be much more interested in results than the welfare state, which I don't think is that interested in results. Um, so the whole incentive, the whole motivation, everything about funding of science would be different. Now, would some things that develop slower? Yes. Would some things that develop faster? I think so. Mm -hmm. um, the whole landscape of technology would be different, mm -hmm. but would it be different in a negative way? I very much doubt it. And let me add one last point. Look, wars happen. Um, I don't deny the need for, for a defense department. I don't deny the need for Defense Department to fund certain types of technology that help defend the state. Um, that would orient technologies in a particular way, whether that from an economic perspective is the best way to orient technologies, probably not, but it's a necessary way in order to facilitate defense, right? So the Defense Department would, would fund certain projects, even if they were not optimal, they would fund them because they need them in order to defend. So yeah, some, developments would happen because of the state, some technologies would advance. And again, it, it might even be suboptimal, but I would be for it because I think a defense department has to stay on top of these things and make sure that it can defend the country. Um, so that, that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually really helpful for me because I think the main thing that you're offering in this conversation that I haven't really done in my own thinking about this is when someone says the state is necessary for the development of highly innovative technologies or the development of really complex industries from scratch in a generation or two. I, I think the, the move you make in the argument is to say, well, compared to what? Like, 
right? And so, um, it, so I don't think you dispute that as a matter of fact, in the last 100 to 150 years, a lot of technologies and industries have been, uh, have depended on high levels of state investment. Well, I would limit that to about, about 70 years because I don't think that's okay. true beyond 70 years. Okay, fair I, enough yeah. for, for, for the last 70 years. But, yeah. but I think, but, but what you're saying, I think is, but let's imagine a world in which the state is radically limited in what it does and all of this capital is in private hands. First of all, you're saying there would be more capital <laughs> yeah. because there'd be more wealth. Um, and, and then a lot of that would be allocated toward the development of innovative technologies and industries. And who's to say that that very distant alternative universe would not uh, would not birth a much more innovative, industrially interesting and advanced society than the one I mean, we currently inhabit? I mean, what we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes. All right, before we go on, reminder, please like the show. We, we've got 163 live listeners right now, uh, 30 likes. That should be at least 100. I figure at least 100 of you actually like the show. Maybe there are like 60 of the Matthews out there who hate it. But, but at least the people who are liking it, you know, I want to see, see a thumbs up. There you go. Start liking it. I want to see that go to 100. All it takes is a click of a, a, click of a, a thing, whether you're looking at this. Uh, and, and, you know, the likes matter. It, it's not an issue of my ego. It's an issue of the algorithm. The more you like something, the more the algorithm likes it. So, you know, and if you don't like the show, give it a thumbs down. Let's see your actual views being reflected in the likes. But uh, if you like it, don't just sit there. Help get the show promoted. Of course, you should also share. And uh, you can support the show at youronbookshow.com slash support or on Patreon or Subscribestar or Locals uh, and, uh, and show your support for all for, for, for the work, for the value hopefully you're receiving from this. And, uh, and of course, don't forget, if you're not a subscriber, even if, you, even if you just come here to troll or even if you're here like Matthew to defend Marx, uh, then uh, you should subscribe because that way you'll know when to show up. You'll know what shows are on, when they're on. You'll get notified, right? So, um, yes, like, share, subscribe, support. Like, share, subscribe, support. There you go. Easy. Do one or all of those, please. <laughs>